I hope you've enjoyed this parable series. Uh, I certainly have. Um, man, it's over today. And uh, we launch a brand new series of messages here very, very soon. I'm excited about it. Uh, next week, I'm telling you, we are unleashing a firestorm of a preacher in this house. Uh, at Pastor Adam Kling from Flagstaff, Arizona is going to be up in this place. And uh, I, I look for, I'm, I'm going to be right there, front and center, uh, on the edge of my seat ready. Uh, he is a blessing to this house. He has preached here twice in the last couple of years. And I was like, man, I don't know. I, I wish I could bring you over here. Can you resign from your church and just be part of this church? He is a blessing. And so uh, he's got a word. He was in tears on the phone just a couple of weeks ago telling me what God had spoken to him. Uh, and so about what about this house and what he's going to share. And so get ready. It's going to be a blessing uh, to the future of this house. And so I encourage you to make sure to be present and be ready to be sewn into. It's going to be a good, good time. I want to welcome everybody online. Let's join our online family. Amen. Those of our, our, our family that are with us right now online, you know, I know it's summer and, and so it starts to look a little more sparse in attendance at times because some people are vacationing. And so if you're watching right now, and you're like you're in Florida on vacation. God bless you. Amen. We love you. We'll hold Troy down for you. All right. We'll keep Lion's Choice in business for you. You don't got to worry about it. Praise the Lord. All right, let's dig in, y'all. Uh, as you know, this parable series, which we pray has been a blessing, parables, as you know, are the symbolic stories that Jesus told, uh, using things from everyday life, illustrating things from everyday life to make very powerful truths for life. And we dug into the parable of the hidden treasure in the field. We talked about the parable of the pearl of great price. We dug into the parable of the soils, the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, and last week, of course, we dug into the parable of the 10 virgins. So we're going to wrap up this series here today uh, talking about this parable found in Luke chapter 18 called the parable of the persistent widow. And Luke chapter 18, look at, look at verse one with me. I got the scriptures for you on the app notes. If you're following along as with us there, you can open up the JC app and uh, click on sermon notes right there. They're for you. We got them for you on the screen. Uh, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to jot that down. It's a powerful passage of scripture. Luke 18, verses one through eight. I'm reading out of the NIV today. It says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He, he said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word, hear your word, receive your word. But Lord, more than anything else, I pray, Lord, that our faith is strengthened Lord, that we live out what we receive in here today. We don't wanna be just hearers. Lord, we wanna be hearers and doers. I pray, guide me, I pray every word I speak here today, that it would be your word and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I, I love this parable, and I think it's really cool that right out the gate, like, <laughs> Scripture kind of does the heavy lifting for us and telling us the purpose of the parable that we're about to read because Jesus said it right there, verse one. It says that Jesus taught the disciples a parable that they should pray and never give up. That they should always pray, verse one says, and never give up, which, which means when we read this parable, we know where our lives need to land in order to live out this teaching. And, and Jesus is teaching here that a sustained prayer life yields powerful results. Can I say that one more time? A sustained prayer life yields powerful results. And of course, we know this. This, this is a truth that is echoed all throughout Scripture. To, 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 to always pray isn't 
a, a strange thing to hear Scripture telling us to do, right? First Thessalonians 5.17 says that we are to pray without ceasing. So, so th this, this is an established truth point. So let's kind of get back to this parable. This parable Jesus is sharing has a, two main characters, right? The first one is, is, is a ruthless, calloused judge who, who could care less about the people that he's placed over to judge. And, and we know this because he said this of himself in verse four. He goes, I don't even fear God so you know I'm not going to care about people. He, he kind of, we understand who he is. The, the second one is, is a widow, a woman in, in this country, in this region, who has, who has lost her husband and, and is being wronged or taken advantage by, by someone in a horrible way. And she just, she just wants justice to be served in her situation by this judge. And it is her persistence. Come on, somebody say persistence. And her persistence alone that grants her the justice she was seeking for by what Jesus calls this unjust judge. And as the judge himself said, all right, I'll give her what she's asking me, but only because she keeps bothering me. And what he said, he goes, I'll see that she gets justice so this lady don't end up attacking me. Come on, how many know, like the fire in, in, in the furnace of her commitment, like, got hotter and hotter the more she was told no. Like, she's just like, she's like earrings off, like we're gonna, she was, she, it's about to get down. And, and, and Jesus says, listen to what the unjust judge says, and, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I, I tell you, Jesus says, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Friends, let me say it again. A sustained prayer life yields powerful results. Has anybody ever heard the, the, uh, the, the poem called The Prayer of Cyrus Brown? Uh, listen to this poem. It says, the proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keys, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Rotwise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped and upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Slow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerely clapped in front. With both thumbs pointing toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year I fell in Hodgkin's well, head first, said Cyrus Brown. With both my heels a-sticking up, my head a-pointing down. And I made a prayer right then and there, best prayer I ever said. The prayingest prayer I ever prayed, friends, I was a-standing on my head. You know, I, I think we can find ourselves overemphasizing things like physical posture when it comes to ensuring that our prayers are heard and, and effective. Like, 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 should I pray with, with my eyes closed or, or, or can they be open? Like, should I kneel or, or, or should I stand? Should, should my hands be folded or, or should I raise them? Should my head be bowed or should my, 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 my head be looking to the heavens? You know, uh, should my words be eloquent or does God want me to use everyday language to make it more authentic? What's the proper posture? I like what Gary Hamrick said when he says, God is not so concerned with your prayer posture as he is your prayer persistence. And that's what this parable is all about. It's being persistent with prayer, to, to pray and to keep on praying and to not allow yourself to be discouraged if your prayers are not immediately being answered. But rather, when it comes to what you're praying for, be persistent. And that's a light that Jesus is shining on this truth by the light that he's shining on this widow. The, the more that this judge dismissed her, the more the widow pursued him. This 
dear sister lacked quit in her commitment. But we got to be careful in our uh, interpretive parallel here because when, when, when I first heard this parable preached, I heard it preached where, where, where you know, we are the widow in the story and Jesus is the, is the judge and, and if we would just nag him to death, you know, you know what I mean? Like if we just get on his nerves like, 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 like this, you ever seen this? Mom, mom. Mom, mommy, 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 mama, 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 ma, 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 mom, 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 mommy, mommy, mama, mama, mama. What? Hi. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, there's some young parents who are like PTSD right now. I didn't appreciate that. You should have warned me. Like, like, if we treat God like that, then we'll eventually get what we want. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and that's really not how this parable is supposed to be interpreted. Like, it, it, it isn't meant to be a parable of comparison so much as, as it's, it's a parable of contrast. And the reason I say that is, God, first of all, is never described in all of the Bible as someone who is unjust. So you can't equate the unjust judge to, to God. And, and, and secondly, most of society cannot relate to being a widow, uh, particularly in this time period. Because somebody in this time period who was a widow was considered the lowest class of people because they were utterly forgotten. They, they, they literally had nothing. And, 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 and so I want you to see the, the contrast that Jesus is making here more so than a comparison because what Jesus is saying is if this unjust judge is able to respond to this persistent widow, and give her what she's asking him for. He says in verse seven, then how much more will God, who is not unjust, he's a caring, loving, grace-giving father in heaven, how much more will he give his children, his chosen people who cry out to him, for what it is that they're asking him for. I believe that the King James uses the words, and will God not avenge his people who are being attacked and crying out to him? So I just want us to see the contrast here. We are not the kids in this parable who get on God's nerves. Not at all, friends. Can I just say this? He's infatuated with you. Like at levels that you nor I, this side of eternity, probably not the other side of eternity either, will ever be able to fathom how much he truly is infatuated with us. Now, the fact that this parable, though, challenges us to be persistent in prayer implies what? What does it imply? It implies that there are times where we won't get what we want when we want it, the way we want it, in prayer. I mean, know what I'm talking about when I say that? All right? No? I'm the only one? All right, I got three people. Praise God. Uh, like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, we, we don't. Otherwise, Jesus, why would he even teach the parable? If every time we got what we wanted, the very moment we asked him, Jesus would have no reason to teach or share this teaching with us. So a big reason he's teaching us this parable is because when we pray, we will not always get what we want when we want it, the way we want it. Can I get an amen, Mick Jagger? Amen. See, he stole that from the parable of the persistent widow. I just want you to see the robbery that's in the entertainment industry. The jokes are free, y'all. I just want you to know that. Like, it's, 
Come on. How many know, like, you won't always get what you, now I'm hearing Mick Jagger in my head when I say that. You won't, you won't always get what you want from God. But you will always get what you need from God. How many hate it that that's true? <laughs> right? It's, there's tension to that many times. And we, cert, we certainly won't get what we want when we want it either. Let me say it this way. Not every prayer yields immediate answers. And that's an understanding that we gotta have going into prayer, which is why Jesus is telling us to not give up and to keep trusting him when you are praying. And, and I think a big response to that could be with respect, why? Why? Why do I need to be persistent when I pray? Like, why can't it just be a one and done thing? Let me give you three quick reasons why you need to be persistent in prayer after looking at this parable. Number one, it's quite possible that what you're praying for is not his will for you. It's, it's, it's possible that what you're praying for right now is not his will for your life. How many know God has a will for your life? On the flip side of that coin, how many know you also have a will for your life? And when I use the word will, I simply mean desire. The word will here means desire. Meaning that there are things that God desires for your life, and then there are things that you desire for your life. And there are times when those two desires don't always hold hands. As a matter of fact, they're not aligned. They're probably warring. They're adversaries with each other. If we're honest, I would think that many of us would say those desires are not aligned most of the time because most of the time, what we want for our life is self-serving, and what God wants for us is more for our spiritual growth and development and good. And it's in those times of prayer when, when our will is not aligned with his will that his will will always prevail. That makes sense? Like, when your wills aren't aligned, it's in prayer where you discover that it's his will that needs to prevail and not yours. And I'm sure you've experienced this as, as I have, where, where in, in my path personally of being persistent towards something that I'm wanting and desiring, I begin to discern later on down the road that, that, that his will is different from, from what I'm wanting. You know, it makes me think of, of this building, this campus, in February of, of, this, of this year, 2013. I think we've been worshiping in this building for uh, uh, seven years now. And, and so I remember when we got this building, and some of you were part of it, that, 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 that experience, but this was an eyesore to the community. And you're like, was? Listen, you don't know the love and attention that's been placed in this baby. Like, this was an eyesore to the community. And, and so when, but it's all we could really that was our capacity of, of, of affording at the time. And we love it and we, we got it. And when we bought it to renovate it, it would be about a million dollars to pay to have somebody do it. And our five-year-old church at the time was just like, not possible, really, when we purchased it. It was very tough to do that. And so we started looking. And of course, so what do we first start doing? You look at that bill, you're like, God, you just go to prayer. And I'm persistently asking God for the money. Like, God, give us the finance. Give us the ability. You know what I mean? Where you're looking for miracle checks in the mailbox. You know what I mean? And there's nothing but two spiders looking at you. Like, ain't nothing in here, you know? You're just like, come on, where, where is it, Lord? And, 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 and it's not coming, and, and I'm praying for it. It's not coming, and I'm realizing, like, maybe this isn't, like, so I start talking with the contractor about the other options. They go, well, there's the option of you guys doing it all yourself. You just pay for the supplies, and that'll cut about $600,000 off of it. I'm going, whoo! All right, uh, I don't want to do that. Amen. How many know what I'm talking about? And so that wasn't what I wanted to do. It isn't what I wanted, but yet as we journeyed in prayer, we found that God's will was different than ours. And so we started owning this ourselves. And, and many of you uh, worked with us in those 
times into the late night hours, building walls, renovating this building, the stage, the drywall, every, the, the amount of work that went in. And I remember we, we worked so hard up until the, the Sunday we were about to call this place our home officially. We had to have the city come and give an inspection and the city inspected it on Thursday. And they said, to worship on Sunday, you have to fix these. And there were 70 violations and the city official goes, I don't know how it's possible even with an army for you to do that. So you might want to think about other plans. And I was sitting there looking at a sheet with 70 violations that got to be fixed because he goes, I'll come back five o'clock Friday. And if it isn't done by then, because it's not open on the weekend, like you're not gonna be able to worship here. And so I watched about 60 or 70 people in this space just, <laughs> just start going everywhere, knocking projects off that list. And there was a, a Julie who's a part of this church still to this day. Like she, she came to me, I remember in that moment, I'm just stressed. Like, you know, it's one of those like, whing, I can't hear nothing hardly. But I saw Julie, she comes to me and she goes, Pastor, we're gonna fix it. We're gonna, we're gonna hit everything on that list. And I go, okay. And I, I went down this hallway into the uh, storage room and I got in a fetal position and I cried like a baby. Literally, to where there was a person on our team at the time was looking for something, open the door, like, whoa, okay, and they just walk back out. I mean, no, it's probably something when you're saying your pastor's, like, uh, 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 and, and they open the door, back, like, pastor, are you all right? And I'm like, I just love these people so much, you know, because I just couldn't believe the faithfulness of God and just the team that he provided, and I kind of understood why God didn't provide those finances, that I was asking for because I can tell you the level of community that took place on those work nights and serve nights and the family atmosphere and the ownership mindset that began to be installed within all of us that this isn't just the staff's building. This is our building, right? This is a building that God gave us as a family. And, and I can honestly say it was absolutely beautiful to see that. He, he, hear me when, when I say this. The longer it takes for you to discern his will for your life, the harder it becomes. And so often it is persistent prayer that holds the key for your ability and mine to discern and know his will for your life in any given circumstance or season. Here's the point. Persistent prayer, more than anything else I would argue, helps you know his will for your life. And it helps you arrive at a heart that says, not my will, but yours be done. Which like what we talked about a few weeks ago is exactly what Jesus was experiencing in the Garden of Gethsemane. A difference of will, a differing of wills that was solved between him and the Father, that was conjoined and unified through what? A time of persistent prayer that the disciples were sleeping on. And Jesus said that to the Father in Matthew 26, 39. After he, he was there, he was stressed and he fell on his face and he said, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. You see, prayer helps you bend your will to the Father. It's not meant to be the other way around. It isn't meant to be us trying to get God to bend to our will. Prayer is your opportunity to know his will for you. Jesus said in Matthew 6, after the disciples asked him, how do we pray? And Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not mine. Your will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. Prayer is your opportunity to know God's will for your life and submit to it. E. Stanley Jones says this. He says, if I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer, he says, is not pulling God to my will. Prayer is rather me pulling myself to his will, aligning my will to the will of God. Ain't that good? So, so we got to be persistent in prayer to know what God's will is because what I'm praying for could not be his will. The second reason we need to be persistent in prayer is, is perhaps what you're, you're praying for is not his timing. 
Now, this is where you might want something that God wants and desires, but your ambition to receive it may be quicker than his is to give it to you. I say this all the time, but this right here is the worst thing you can bring into your prayer closet. Your watch. It's, it's how many times do our frustrations with God rest in the timing of his provision for our lives? How many times do we call him late for dinner? How many times do we call him an 1159 God? Which insinuates what? That God is late. You see, persistent prayer isn't just our opportunity to know what God's will is for us, but it's also your opportunity to know when God's will is for your life. It makes me think about David where, you know, we're actually gonna dig into David this fall. I can't wait for that series. We're gonna do a sermon series on him from the shepherd boy all the way to the throne. Uh, but, but, you know, 2 Samuel chapter five says that David was 30 years old when he became king. And, and he reigned for 40 years after that. But how many know he wasn't 30 years old when Samuel came to him and anointed him as the king of Israel prophetically? He was 14 years old then. And actually, he was 15 when he <laughs> slew Goliath. Wasn't that an insane sound effect that I just gave you right there? That was, uh, some of you are like, whoa, I'm, I'm back in time. Like, he, he was 15 years old. You wait, I'll do it again. <laughs> Sorry, I spit. Nope, nope. Courtesy claps. You know what courtesy claps do? It encourages bad humor to continue. So when you laugh at a bad joke, what are you doing? You're setting up somebody else to hear that joke. If you don't want, it, if you don't want yourself or the world to hear it again, just leave it be. Leave it be silent. You know what I'll do? I'll never do the <laughs> again. Ever again. He was 15 years old when he slew Goliath. Did somebody just try and do it? All right. It's not as good as me. Good try, though, but. And you know what he did? He spent 15 years after Goliath doing what? Running for his life from Saul, who was the current king of Israel, and he wasn't too stoked about the choice that God was making to replace him. You know, there are psalms that David wrote in that 15-year time span where he was waiting to become king while he's hiding in caves for his life from the current king. And one of them is Psalm 13, verse 1, where David starts off by going, How long, O Lord? Anybody ever said that before? Will you forget me forever? This is David saying this, a man after God's own heart. So I don't want you to fall under condemnation when you say these things. Because we're all like, how long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? What's that mean? Every second of every day, I've got tension over this. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Let me say it this way. We all have moments where we feel with all our being that God has forgotten us or, or, he was, or he's abandoned us and he's left us to, to, to just lie in the ruin of destruction. We all do, but, but here's where persistent prayer becomes so fruitful in our lives because persistent prayer allows you to trust God even when it comes to his timing for your life. As frustrated as David was in the beginning of Psalm 13, I encourage you to read the whole psalm later this afternoon. It ends with, 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 with trust in God, nonetheless, in trusting in his timing. David basically saying, God, you know what? I, 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 I'm struggling, but I know deep within me that you do have my well-being at the forefront of your intentions. So I trust you and and so in that moment in 2 Samuel 5, 4, when David was 30 and he got to the throne that God prepared for him to sit on 15 years, 16 years before that, what we see in this moment when David sits on the throne is a David who is, 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 is a still, firm man after God's trust in his heart for God in all things, including God's timing in all things. You see that level of trust in David's leadership. You know, I think one, a, a truly great book 
for anybody to read uh, that's going through a struggling season is a book by Gene Edwards called The Tale of Three Kings. A Tale of Three Kings by Gene Edwards. It's a wonderful book that makes a power. It's, it, it, it's, it's an allegorical book, it's, it, but it's so geniusly telling the story of David. And, and it offers a powerful perspective on, on how we view struggles that happen to us. In that he says that if God gave David the throne at 14, David wouldn't have been ready for all that throne would demand of his life. He said that God is perfect in his timing and that God used those 16 years of adversity under Saul to bring the king out of David. He said the king was in him, but God used the adversity to bring the king out of him. How many know sometimes God can use, not that he causes it, how many know he can use adversity to bring the potentials out of your life? How many verses are, are there in scripture that speak to this? And, and let's keep it on the context of timing. How many verses are there in scripture that start with the words, hurry up? I didn't see one in there, I looked but I do see a lot of verses in the Bible that start with the word wait. One of them, David himself wrote in Psalm 27, 14, when he said, wait. Come on, somebody say, wait. I don't like saying it as much as you don't like saying it. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. And he says, wait, I say, on the Lord. Persistent prayer allows you the opportunity to faithfully wait and trust in his timing at all times. Somebody say a good amen if you believe that. God's timing is perfect. The, the third reason we need to be persistent in prayer isn't just because persistent prayer allows us to know what his will is for our life, when his will is for our life, but can I say that the reason we need to be persistent in prayer is because perhaps what you're praying for is not his best for your life. Maybe God has something better than what it is you're asking him for. Or let me say it this way. Maybe God has someone better than who it is you're asking him for. Come on, somebody. You know what I mean. Like, like, like a single lady who's praying for a Christian stud, right? And, and wouldn't you know it, two months later, some dude comes and she thinks she has found the one. But then just as fast as he came, two months later, he bolts. And she's like, God, what happened? I prayed for a stud and now he's gone. And God's like, no, that wasn't a stud that was a spud. You had the wrong potato, lady. He ain't right for you. I got somebody better for your life. Could it be, come on, that God has someone for you who will treat you like you deserve to be treated? That God has someone for you who will love you like you deserve to be loved? I mean, oh, God has someone for you that will serve you and value you like you deserve to be served and valued. Don't settle for anything less than God's best for your life, no matter who it is or what it is you're praying for. Somebody say a good amen in this house right now. Come on, let me just hang on that note. Like, how many have ever prayed this prayer? Like, 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 thank God I didn't end up with that person. Come on, don't look around the room when I say that. You know what I mean? But, but thank God I didn't end up with them. Do you ever pray that, miss? Thank God you didn't end up with Steve Sharp. She says she prays it every day. Every day she prays it. Because of who she has now in her life. Do you understand? <laughs> Poor Steve Sharp. <laughs> anyway, she dated some, anyway, all right. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, for I know the plans I have for you. God says, I know the plans I have for you. And might I give you context to that? Like that's talking about even when you're going through tough times, like, and God says, you're gonna go through some tough times. But you got to know, like, I know the plans I have for you. My, my brother and sister, 
in this room right now, God's will for your life is filled with the best for your life. That could be a tattoo right there. God's will for your life is filled with the best for your life. And we, of course, have no way of fully knowing what all that entails, which is why he calls us to pray persistently. Praying persistently helps you know what his will is for your life. Trust when his will is for your life and know that he has the best of blessing intended for you in that will for your life. Without persistent prayer, because if you're not persistently praying, you will always succumb to the tensions of trusting that. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. How many know that's our command for us, from God? Ask, seek, knock. But those three words, ask, seek, knock, are what theologians call active imperative words, which which means they are continual in action. So it's not saying ask once and don't ask again. Seek once or twice. It's active imperative, which it literally translates ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking and knock and don't stop knocking. Not because it's a game to God to see who can knock the longest. No, because we, it's because we don't know what he's up to all the time. And, and persistent prayer allows us the opportunity to know what he's up to, to know when he's up to it, and to know just how good for us what he's up to is. Does that make sense? Romans chapter 12 and verse 12 is my last scripture I wanna read with you where, 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 where Paul says, and I pray you just receive this into your life. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Can I tell you, this widow's passionate pursuit to not give up before an unjust judge who didn't at all care about her should encourage all of us in this room to have no excuse to passionately pursue, or should I say excuse to stop passionately pursuing a generous, loving, caring father who has nothing but the best of care for you. Meaning we have more reasons to be motivated than she did to never allow anything to stand in our way of pursuing God through persistent prayer. If this widow kept pursuing this unjust judge, then Jesus is saying, why are we quitting on pursuing a caring, loving father? Come on, look at the contrast here. Don't don't see the comparison. Look at the contrast. She was appealing to a cold-hearted judge. What are we doing when we pray? We're appealing to a warm-hearted father. She approached a court of law. What are we doing when we pray? We're approaching a throne of grace. She got justice. What do we get? We get mercy and grace and provision. And, and, and of course, just, friends, prayer is your route to trusting this. This is why prayer is, 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 is not an obligation. Prayer is an invitation. So, so can we stand to our feet here today? And let's just right now, perhaps, just close our eyes in this room. And the reason I say that is sometimes we just got to close our eyes to see, if that makes sense. And would you just see prayer as as that invitation from God for you to just trust him in what he has for your life, when he has it for your life, and to know that it's the best for your life? Because maybe there's people in this room that have just dropped their pursuit to persistently pray. Because you have had 
or you have been given a bad definition on what his provision is for you. God just saying, trust me. Don't stop coming to me. So Lord, I just pray right now the Holy Spirit would just minister right now to every person in this room. by just showing them what they need to do right now. Like Journey Church, how, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you right now in your life from this message? Like what is, what is he saying to you? What has the thread of his voice been saying to you listening to this talk here today? Because what he's saying to you is what you need to embrace and listen to. So Father, I, I thank you for prayer. I've, I've heard it said that the only wrong way to pray is if we don't. And Lord, we, we know that prayer is sometimes us talking and Sometimes prayer, most of the time, it's us listening. But it's, it's our opportunity to be with you and to get to know you more and more every day. And, and it allows us to experience all the amazing things you have for us in this life that you've so wonderfully created. And I pray, God, that every person in this room would walk out these doors with a determination to pray persistently. Because again, it's not an obligation. You're not an unjust judge. You're rather, Lord, a, an amazing, good, grace-giving Father.
Lord, you are so perfect. Thank you so much for your will for us, that you even would, would have it in you to make it a thing for you to plan out our futures. God, to plan out with such detail, Lord, that you even have certain timings that you want things to happen so that your best can come to fruition for us. So thank you, God, for the love that you show us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And as our altar team makes their way forward, I want to invite you. If you don't know this Christ that we've been talking about, if you don't know the Savior, we would love to connect him to you. So please take a moment and come up here, meet one of these awesome people and, and find out who this Savior is. Or maybe you do know him and you want to grow a little more in him. You want to learn a little bit more about what this journey looks like. We would love to connect with you and walk with you through that journey. Find his timing, find his will, find his voice. We would love to stand with you in that. Or maybe there's something going on in your life that, that man, you need somebody to stand with you and believe. You, you need somebody to, to be there and put their faith next to your faith to see this happen inside of your life. We would love to be those people for you. Amen? Amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for coming today. We got our offering station in the back. And then the connect spot is right outside the auditorium to the right. If you're new, we would love to meet you, give you a free gift. Or if you want to sign up for kids camp, youth camp, any of that stuff, you can do that there. Thank you so much for sharing your Sunday with us.